Well, thank you everybody for coming out. Uh, my name is Jana Iyengar and um, I am going to talk today about how to fit square pegs in round pipes. And I do not have square pegs with me and I don't have round pipes, but um, hopefully I'll get you to understand how to do those things today. Um, well, so this talk is really about a project called Minion and this is joint work with uh, Brian Ford at Yale and um, um, a number of other folks um, at Yale and Franklin and Marshall College, which by the way is a small liberal arts college in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And I hope you can, I am half Amish, if you couldn't tell. <laughs> I'm not, which, I'm not. Which half? <laughs> the half that loves technology. So, um, so this is joint work and um, and we, uh, I'll start the talk by, by going into what happened a long time ago. And, and some of you were actually around when this happened. So a long, long time ago, uh, TCP used to be, and in some ways it still is, was built at least as the internet workhorse. This was a reliable oriented, uh, reliable ordered uh, connection oriented byte stream and, and it also had flow control, right? It was brand new. And uh, UDP was also built as a transport no-op basically. It largely was a transport no-op. Um, it did DMUX. I'll give you that. But that's what it did. Um, applications were largely happy as well at this time. TCP generally sufficed. There was Telnet, there was FTP, SMTP, and, and, and you could basically do with, um, uh, with TCP and UDP for these things. UDP was built for simple messaging, and it served wonderfully well for simple messaging, and that was all fantastic. So, um, uh, that was fine early on, but over the next several moons, um, TCP continued to mature. As you would have expected, it was the internet workhorse. And it continued to mature with new things getting added. Congestion control came in, ECN and AQM came in, and now we have MPTCP for multiple network interfaces. So all of these things that keep coming into uh, uh, TCP, and UDP remained a no-op. You really can't do very much with a no-op. It's a no-op, right? So... Um, uh, this with, even with this, however, uh, changes coming in TCP, modern apps found these services insufficient. We have real-time audio and video communication, which many of you are familiar uh, uh, with the problems that they have with TCP. And uh, uh, there's multimedia streaming. There was the web, which had trouble with TCP early in the day as well. And so um, uh, we had all of these 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 issues, and then we built new transports in response. The, the networking community went out and said, you know, we need to do next generation things for these next generation applications that are coming out, and we'd like to build these. And so we started building them, and we did. We built SCPP, RSC 4960 came out, well, 2960 came out in 2000, the year 2000. And it gave multi-streaming, message boundaries, multi-homing, so you could do multi-path. It gave partial reliability, so you could do fun things with audio and video where you could cancel transmissions and so on. And it, it, it had condition control built in, uh, in quite a neat way. Um, and then we went out and built DCCP, which was basically UDP with condition control. That was the goal, right? And this was supposed to be for audio, video streams, for media streams. And so we did all of these things. And then we also had some research proposals for the transport, SST, uh, partial order, uh, POC, and then beep. Anybody here remember or no beep? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm classifying it as a transport. And if you want to argue with me on that, I will. Um, but we built beep. We built all of these different transports, and, uh, and we tried to deploy them, but the internet remained loyal, like completely loyal. Only TCP and UDP got through middle boxes. And we couldn't really do very much with this, right? Sometimes only TCP got through middle boxes, and often only to port 80 or 443, right? These are the only ones which remain sort of open, so to speak. And new transports rarely ever got through. And even now, it's, it means the case that new transports rarely get through. Uh, SCDB and DCCP are still not supported mostly by middle boxes. And uh, it's almost impossible to build and deploy a brand new transport on, right on top of IP. And this remains the case for us, right? Uh, so how deep does this loyalty run? Um, what are we talking about when we talk about middle boxes? So the first middle box uh, that we talk about is basically a NAT, right? Let me see if I have this thing with me. This is a NAT. 
and that's i mean the reason i'm doing that is more than just for comic effect is to is to is drive home the point that these are incredibly pervasive right you know we're talking about middle boxes as something somewhere in the middle it's not really it's all over the place it's a ubiquitous box so we have nats all over the place and we know what they do um we all are familiar with firewalls these are essentially boxes that um uh, have the purpose of protecting uh, of of security but also that of enforcing network policy so if you want to disallow something if you want to disallow udp for example from getting into your network then you do that at a firewall so that's what firewalls are used for then there's traffic shapers all of us are familiar with these as well that control how much uh, bandwidth is given to what kind of application and so on and so forth and then there's the less understood perhaps uh, box the performance enhancing proxy which does a whole slew of different things and does them so transparently until it breaks of course when it's no longer transparent but uh, these boxes are all over the network all of these boxes are sort of distributed all through this network so we have uh, <clears throat> these boxes and then several more that maybe even i'm not familiar with uh, uh, and there are a number of these things that are in the in the network that are now glued in so to speak are tied into tcp and udp and other uh, transports don't really make the cut so to speak so what are applications doing in the meanwhile right well we have this sort of uh, uh, net we we already said that there were these transports and then there were there was a need but then when we built new transports those didn't get deployment because middle boxes didn't were were loyal to tcp so to speak uh, so what are applications doing in the meanwhile well no prices for guessing this one um, they basically build their own abstractions on top of udp and tcp we do this on a routine basis we do this so routinely that we even ask the question why would you do anything else right why would you go out and build a new transport but this is what we do we build everything on top of this we use multiple uh, tcp connections from what what really ought to have been multi streaming when you use multiple connections between a browser and a server what you are looking for is parallelism not multiple connections we do that using multiple connections because that's the only mechanism we have that's the only tool we have that works um and we do other stuff on top of udp in cases where tcp is too much of a constraint so that's what we do uh this has of course its own issues right abstracting on udp eventually leads to something that looks a little bit more and more every day like tcp on top of udp it's it's really fascinating when you see these iterations of applications that start off on udp going obviously tcp is not my answer i'm going to build everything on udp and then they start building and this one of the first things that they realize is i do want to try and do retransmissions if i can right i want to try and get as much reliability as i can not perfect but at least some and then slowly does the flow control comes in because the receiver is running out of buffer so that you need push back go wait you you're dialing the clock back 30 years right these are questions that are answered and then eventually some sort of rate control uh, sets right in because the, you don't want the sender to send much more than the network can manage simply because you can do more fine tuning at the sender if you know what the rate allowable rate on the network is and so some sort of congestion control creeps in so you basically start getting closer and closer to tcp and that happens but unfortunately because of these middle boxes in the network still see this as udp there's poor interaction between those two things and one example is uh, there's no session state at middle boxes so a nat box for instance on top of which you run uh, through which you're running a udp you, through which you're running udp traffic doesn't understand an upper level session right so it's going to drop nat state at some point that's going to be much sooner than it would drop a tcp connection state because the tcp is looking for the fin or a reset or something to drop that state so um, so basically udp at second of udp can interact poorly with udp service model and when i say udp service model it's not just at the endpoints it's also in the network also in middle boxes in the network so um, at second of tcp has its effect and we know these ones quite well right there's added buffering and added latency and there's can be poor interactions between an application tuning its rate and tcp's congestion control and all of that fun stuff right so there can be poor interactions here as well so these are necessarily uh, really good substrates these weren't built to be very good substrates and certainly the network didn't see them as substrates it just looks at them as transports so um, what have we done so far 
what have we as a networking community done to address this issue? Because we have this problem, right? We have networks that are not moving, and we have applications that have needs. So what have we done so far? Well, we started off by saying NATs are evil. That was our first response, right? We said NATs are evil. We're not going to care about them. And then we said it'll all change with IPv6. So we know how that's gone. Um, but I won't, I won't say that. I, I, I won't say we know how that's gone. The answer to this question isn't necessarily IPv6, um, is what I want to say. So, and then we said, don't design around metal boxes. It'll only encourage them. So we won't, we'll sort of let them be there, but you're not going to design with them in mind. And then he said, wait, wait, we'll accept them, but we'll specify how they ought to behave. Because we want to be able to control, because we have to interact with these things. There's no choice left here. And then finally, we gave up. So why build a new transport? It's not going to work. We'll just build everything on top of TCP and UDP, right? So we started off with denial. We moved on to anger. We went on to bargaining. And then we ended up in depression. And if you know where I'm going with this, the final stage is acceptance. So I think it's about time that we came to terms with the fact that middle boxes are, in fact, here to stay. right? And we should stop grieving. Uh, it's time to accept this and move along and see what we can do with this. So here are a couple of, here's one big new design assumption uh, for end-to-end um, -end services that we need to make which is that new end-to-end -end services cannot require changes to middle boxes to get deployed. So if I'm building a new end-to-end -end service, I can't wait for middle boxes to do something before I see deployment. That's not really going to happen. A consequence of this is that new end-to-end -end services must appear as legacy protocols on the wire. So that anything that we build that's new should get through the network as it is. That's a consequence of this assumption. And I'm going to run with this, because this is what I think we need to come to terms with. Um, so this is, I mean, it's not, a, um, it's not an accident that people had difficulty, or people still have, folks in the networking community still have trouble coming to terms with middle boxes. It's because we didn't put them in there in the first place. We have a network. We built a network that was supposed to be open. And there are these boxes that are sort of come into play in the network and are starting to control, in some ways, what I would call the architecture of the internet. These are what I'm calling now accidental control points, right? I mean, these, these middle boxes have started to control the architecture, but they're doing so accidentally. So uh, to give you a sense for what the networking community came, how the networking community came at this, uh, it's instructive to go back to this RFC. Uh, if you've not seen this before, it's the NAT RFC, uh, RFC 1641 from 1994. And I'll read this loud because I think this is worth it. The two most compelling problems facing the IP internet are IP address depletion and scaling and routing. Until the long-term solutions are ready, an easy way to hold down the demand for IP addresses is through address reuse. And this was the, 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 the at the time, the crushing issue was at this, uh, the, the expected running out of addresses. And that was a, a mechanism to, to uh, allow us to extend that time frame, right? The fun part of this comes in the conclusion of this document. NAT has several negative characteristics that may make it inappropriate as a long-term solution and, get this, may make it inappropriate even as a short-term solution. They knew this. They knew that this was a problem. And we all knew that this was, and the, the stunning thing is that when you look at the document, in the conclusions, there are a list of things that can go bad with NATs that can go wrong when you have NATs in the network. And the last item there is things will break, FTP or something like that, FTP, SNMP, comma, you name it. <laughs> it basically says that in the RFC or for NAT, right? I mean, so we knew this. And yet we went with this because it was a pressing issue. And sometimes it's not just the issue that drives deployment. It's a number of other organic factors that we can't control anymore. And it's something that we need to sort of come to terms with. So our idea is to say, well, this is the state of affairs as it is. We've tried, we've had NATs, we put in NATs in 90, early in the, in the mid 90s as a stopgap solution, knowing that maybe it wasn't good even for that, but we still have it. This is just NATs, right? This is just NATs. Number of boxes in the network didn't even come up by design. They just came up organically. So we uh, 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 came up with this idea, and I'm going to describe it now. This is the Minion Suite, which is basically, as we call it, a packet pack horse for deploying new transports. 
Um, and I'll, 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 I'll split this, I'll, I'll break this down in a moment. What we basically try to do in Minion is we use legacy protocols like TCP, TLS, but we use them as a substrate. We use them as a basis on which we can build new services so that we can build new services that applications want. So we are trying to do the same thing, or, or not the same thing, we're trying to use existing transport uh, 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 protocols as a basis on which we can build um, new services that applications want. When I say protocols, what I'm talking about here is the wire format. And when I say the wire format, what I mean is not just the headers, but also the state machine. Because there are machines, there are devices in the network which track the state machine of a TCP connection, for example. In, uh, for instance, there are intrusion detection modules or boxes that actually track the state machine and look to see whether a retransmission is the same as a transmission and so on and so forth. So that's pretty crazy, but it's there. And so um, we, when I say we use legacy protocol, we, we constrain ourselves to using the wire format and the state machine, but we try to do change everything else. So um, that's our overall uh, minion suite thing. And so main goals here are to see how far can we stretch the TCP wire format. Right. So the, the, the constraint here is that we have devices in the network which are stuck to, tied down to the wire format of the TCP protocol. They expect to see TCP on the wire. So say, well, let's give them TCP on the wire and let's see what else we can do at the ends with the TCP wire format. Right. If we can open it up at the ends, we can, we can at least we want to try and see how far we can open it up at the endpoints. So uh, <clears throat> that's a, that was our main goal. And our sub goal was to say, well, TCP is becoming increasingly a substrate. It is something that's being used as a substrate. Let's just make it a good substrate, right? And the big one here was to eliminate, try and eliminate uh, latency in the uh, in the protocol itself. So, not in the protocol, but in, in common protocol implementations, or at least the way people see the TCP service model. Um, that's what we wanted to go after. So, uh, a big constraint for us was to ensure incremental deployability. We wanted to try and keep incremental deployability as a goal. Because again, we are trying to get over the problem of not being able to deploy new transport services. It wouldn't help if we came up with a solution that also had trouble getting deployed, significant trouble anyways. So um, so our constraint was this, uh, was to try and get incremental deployability in. And so to, to, to explain um, Minion, which I will in a moment, in a, a snapshot, um, we had a paper at NSDI this year at, uh, the, at, this, at the NSDI conference, and one of the anonymous reviewers said a couple of things which fit quite nicely, so I have them here. Uh, it said, it's a reasonably performing solution to what is sadly a real practical problem. And they also said that Minion accepts the new narrow waste as TCP and shows that with enough, this I love, devious thought, one can manage to implement functionality at cross purposes with TCP on top of it. So we've sort of tried to do that. So I mean, I, what I want to say is that we've tried to do this. Well, here's here's something that's interesting. This was one of this was on the review. This was a strength that was a weakness. I'll let you figure out where they should fall. Um, I mean, I, I buy that. I understand why that's a weakness. But that is that actually pretty precisely what we do do. So here's the rest of the talk. I'm going to start with an overview of Minion. Um, I'm going to talk about UTCP and UCOBS, which basically give us unordered delivery in TCP um, and make a datagram service look like a TCP stream on the wire. That's our goal. If you can achieve that, you can build stuff on top of the datagram service. Um, and then we do the same thing, but we do it this time with SSL so that you actually get datagrams that are completely indistinguishable from something like HTTPS. Right? And you get another datagram service, so you can build stuff on top of it. So, and then I'll talk about the, our implementation and impact on, on, on real applications. Real applications in quotes, because we, uh, well, we built some of them, but we also basically emulated these applications. We used real traces and real data, though. Uh, I'll talk about that when I get there. So yes? I'm curious why you choose TCP as a substrate instead of this unknown. So that's something that's commonly done, right? That's very commonly done. The problem is that middle boxes don't necessarily understand what it is that you're tunneling through UDP. So if you have a middle box and you're tunneling a session through UDP, you still have to build in code to make sure that when a, that middle boxes don't say drop state, 
early on, or they don't assume that this is a UDP uh, um, a, a random. I mean, there's, there's interactions between um, an application that is trying to maintain session state and uh, a uh, middle box that doesn't understand that there is such a thing for UDP. That's the one thing. The second answer is that there's there are boxes in the network like performance enhancing proxies that actually do things with TCP congestion control to make it better over network links. And they can do nothing when you're tunneling everything through UDP. They can't even participate. So we try, I mean, we don't, I don't want to come off wrong in this. I don't want to treat middle boxes as an adversary. I think they're doing something in the network for operators, which is valuable for operators. And that's why they're going to be there. Our goal is to try and work with them. Right? So we're not trying to tunnel through middle boxes. We're trying to work with whatever it is that they do. So I, I want to clarify that as well. Yes. So you, you brought up the interesting question of why you can TCP is the thing that's most fearful, being able to modify the TCP client to both ends, hmm. which, which is sometimes as difficult or more difficult than right. modifying the middle boxes, which you agree is an unachievable goal. Right. So that, uh, maybe you can wait and contrast that or maybe we should let well, I, let me let me let me get through the talk because this is actually quite interesting. The incremental deployability thing I'll, we can talk about later as well. I think it's a really it's one of the cool things about Minion is that you get incremental deployability here, which is which I which I like, and I think the incentives are aligned well, and if I'll try to get to that later as well. Yes. Mm. Yes. I agree. So that's actually a very good reason why you want to retain a lot of TCP. So that's precisely right. I think there's, uh, I don't know if everybody can hear what you said, but sure, I try to, well, I'll repeat what you said, which is that there's a lot of engineering that goes into tweaking and making TCP stacks work well. And having, uh, have use, reusing that code, reusing those stacks is valuable instead of rebuilding your own repeatedly. I'm, I'm, I'm obviously paraphrasing here, but that was the gist of it. So I think that's a very valuable point as well. And we try to do that as much as we can in Minion. It's one of our goals was that too. So what is in the Minion suite? Um, the Minion suite has a few components, and I'll throw them all up together in one shot. Uh, I'll go through this in pieces. So the first part, just look below the red line. Um, and if I wasn't half Amish, this would be animated. See, there's my evidence. Um, is it okay to take pot shots like that? Um, so under the red line, there's um, there's the kernel. That's our kernel space, right? And we have TCP in here, UDP implementations, and other uh, uh, transport protocol implementations which live in the kernel. Typically, we extend TCP here, and we extend it to be something called UTCP. I'll get to that in a moment. But that's an optional minion ex extension uh, to TCP. Um, Above the OS API, above the Sockets API, we have a user space library that sort of sits right on top of this uh, stack and does a bunch of um, bit munging between what comes out of here and what the application expects to see. Yes? No, no, you should not read your diagram like that. It, it, this whole box, UTLS and UCOBS will work with uh, either of these, yes. Right? And if you want UDP, I mean, we haven't really, so we can, we, we can throw in shims here that allow you to work natively with protocols that you want to use. The point here being that an application doesn't care what protocol you like you use here below. If anybody's familiar with Beep, this is one of the things I loved about Beep, was that you don't have to choose, the application doesn't have to say, I want SCTP, I want TCP. That seems like generally a bad idea, because an application doesn't, especially in this world where not everything may get through the network. We need a part, we need a piece here that basically says, this is going to work, use this, you want these services, I'll try to give them to you, right, as best as we can, try and match those things. But the goal here is for the Minion Protocol Suite to try and use one of these transports where the application gets a service right there. We have an unordered datagram delivery service that appears right here, on top of which you can build things like multi-streaming and other things that I'll talk about later in the talk. So that's what we want to be able to do. Okay, so uh, I'll start here with uh, uh, UTCP. I'm going to talk mostly in this talk about UCOBS 
and UTCP. I'll briefly skim over UTLS and I'll point you to papers which have uh, detailed descriptions of these pieces. But I'm going to talk about UCOPS and UTCP for the rest of the talk. So let's start with UTCP, which basically stands for unordered TCP. And we were surprised that nobody had taken this UTCP acronym. Um, I guess nobody had thought about unordered TCP before. That's not entirely true. It's not actually. Others have as well. But UTCP was not taken, so we took it. So what is UTCP? Well, we introduced two new socket options in Linux, and that should tell you what UTCP does. The first one is SO unordered receive. Right? So what it does is basically the kernel delivers all incoming data <coughs> excuse me, immediately up the socket. So if there's data coming in, it's out of order, doesn't matter, everything just goes up into user space, okay, up through the socket. And it also delivers a TCP sequence number with data. We'll get into this, we'll show you uh, something that describes this in more detail. And then we have SO unordered send, which basically accepts a priority with every application message. When an application sends on a message to the socket, also specifies a priority. And the kernel code, UTCP in the kernel, uses to put that in a priority queue. Okay, not in a fee for socket buffer, in a priority queue at the, at the socket buffer. So, <clears throat> we should be thinking, what's SOC stream doing with SO unordered receive, SO unordered? Right? SOC stream and SO unordered don't really fit, but that's what we've tried to do here. Um, so let's look at unordered receive. I'll talk about that here, uh, and we, um, I won't talk about unordered send, but I'll show you results with it. So what's unordered receive? Well, here's what happens in normal TCP. You have data coming in in order. Let's say that's 101, and that's in order. It's right past the QMAC point. So the PS gets queued, and the application is blocked on a read, so application gets that data immediately delivered because it's in order. Data appears that's not in order. There is a gap. Data got dropped perhaps in the network, and the application is blocked on a read. This data comes in but gets queued, waiting for the application, waiting for the retransmission of this data, of the, of the missing data to come through, which eventually does, and then everything is given up, given sent up to the application. There's a period in which obviously there's data that's blocked in the kernel. So with UTCP, things proceed as normal when you have data coming in in order. With one modification, we also send up the sequence number, okay? And you need that to make sense of this in uh, the library above. So when data comes out of order, it goes into the out of order queue, but it also gets delivered right up to the application, okay? It just gets delivered right up. And then when data fills the hole, that gets delivered as well. So the big difference here was with 301, right? Was with the out of order data that just gets delivered immediately, but we are also delivering the sequence number. So again, Going back to this question of what is SOC stream doing with this unordered? Are you trying to say something by queuing it? Yeah, out of order queue is while it's delivering it, or is that just accidental? Well, it's uh, right. So that's actually um, it it's, should get delivered in this case. It does. It does in our implementation. It does get delivered, and there's no queue. Oh, oh, it gets delivered here in our implement. So, so uh, you don't need to queue it. You're right. Um, we for um, purposes of not changing the code too much, we leave it there and we deal with duplicates up in user space. So that can be changed though. I mean, that's a question of whether you can make it work or not. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, well, you need to do your duplicates anyways in user space. It doesn't matter whether you're going to deliver this or not. So, um, um, S on ordered and SOC stream. What are we going to do with Unordered bytes. Unordered bytes. Doesn't make sense, right? How do you know what's ordered and what's unordered? Well, as it turns out, we can't, we have basically these, uh, hmm, this is odd. Okay. Um, there's no inherent structure in a byte stream. I mean, the only structure is that it's, it's, it's a linear byte stream. It's a stream of bytes, right? I mean, that's the one structure that there's in it. There's in it. Middle boxes can resegment TCP segments, so a TCP segment doesn't hold structure per se. It doesn't hold meaning across the network. Um, and so you need a message framing mechanism which allows us to detect messages in arbitrary byte fragments because the receiver is basically going to get these random byte fragments. They're not random, but arbitrary in sequence space. It could be after a big gap and there's this bunch of bytes that have appeared. For the receiver to actually make sense of this data, you need to have some structure in there some way of framing, some framing that you can detect that there's a message in there. And that's something 
that we need to make sense of this out of order of this SO unordered in SOC stream. And we do that with self delimiting framing. Basically what we are looking for here is a framing that identifies itself. A framing mechanism that can say all you need to see is this frame and you know that's a complete frame. You don't need any bytes before it, no bytes after it. And COBS, which is an encoding mechanism, it's called consistent, it stands for consistent overhead byte stuffing, which was built for a completely different context, um, is, becomes very useful here for us. So we use COBS for this and I'll talk about this briefly. Basically what we do is we take an application message at the send side, we encode it with COBS. And before we encode it with COBS, we take the application message, we slap two zeros at the two ends. Okay, two zeros, because what we want at the receiver is when the receiver receives a byte, fra a, a fragment of a byte stream, it finds one zero, finds another zero, and goes, ah, there's my message. So now it doesn't depend on any other bytes. But well, there's a problem here, right? That you need to escape all the zeros inside the data. And that there's a problem with this, which is that you can do several different encodings. We choose to go with COBS because it's really efficient. So uh, COBS allows us to eliminate zeros in this original data. And, in, and it also allows us to have a guaranteed maximum bit overhead of 0.4%, which is about six bytes for an Ethernet frame. It's pretty good, which is really good. In fact, it's something that we can actually we can actually leave space for when you're taking application messages in, right? You can leave the six bytes of space and you can encode and add, uh, increase up to expand up to six bytes and you can send this off. So you can use other frame, other uh, encoding mechanism here, COBS happens to be a good one that we use. It remains the same. It doesn't change. That's a that's a maximum bit overhead. And you need to understand the mechanism is actually fairly straightforward. Uh, no, it's a maximum guarantee. So that's it is precisely what was worth me. What's it? Yes. So I meant to mention that this is actually. Uh, Stuart Cheshire's PhD thesis from Stanford from 98, I think, 97 or 98 or some, some year like that. It was built for a different context, but it's a fantastic idea that we are able to use here uh, in this context. Um, so that's what we uh, do for, for this. And I can go into COBS later at the end of the talk, um, but I think it's a pretty cool mechanism. It can be extended in interesting ways too. Uh, we can get to that later. So. Um, so now what we have is the ability to pick up frames from arbitrary byte chunks at the receiver as long as the sender cobs and codes and sends them in, right? And so this is how we use Minion. An application that's using Minion, basically a, U, a, a UCOPS sender takes a message, cobs and codes it, slaps zeros, and sends it down with a priority that application specifies, okay? And sends it using UTCP. At the receiver, um, these byte blobs come out and a receiver, a uh, the user space, a UCOPS receiver can decode these frames or application messages and deliver them even if there's a loss. So what we've done here is effectively sitting on top of TCP, we basically deliver everything we can, right? And we can deliver frames or, you know, if you want to think about them as datagrams, that's fine too. Except that they are still reliable in this case, and we can talk about that later. Uh, I'd love to talk about reliability. That's a question I'm looking into now. So um, that's what we do at the center and at the receiver. We can do a very similar thing with UTLS. The cool thing here is that UTLS has its own framing mechanism. We don't even need to use UCOPS for this or anything else. UTLS uses the SSL framing mechanism, and we use that. We can actually work with that. So UTLS protects end-to-end -end signaling and data, and it looks like SSL or TLS on the wire, right? But we are able to provide autogram, out-of-order datagram service with this. So how do you do out-of-order uh, uh, decoding? I'll talk about that in just a moment. So this basically allows us to make it so that your stream is completely indistinguishable. And again, this is not an adversarial position. When I say indistinguishable, the idea here is that they don't need to necessarily do anything for this to get through. Right, so uh, uh, the, the, only the encrypted content gets affected. So the main challenge is here is that SSL was built for order delivery using TCP. It, it assumes things about sequential delivery at the receiver for decoding and decrypting. So these records, these TLS records, are not encoded for out-of-order decoding. 
So the receiver, you have to overcome a couple of, a few challenges, three uh, uh, in, well, so there, there are these, these particular challenges where you have to basically, uh, uh, these uh, cipher suites are chained across, the encryption state is chained across these, these TLS records. And you have uh, uh, this implicit record counter that are, that's in the MAC inside of these frames. And when you don't have order, if you receive an arbitrary frame at the receiver, you have to do something to figure out what that MAC is. And basically what we do is we guess. We guess MACs and we scrub a few and we can figure this out. So very quickly what we do is we try to decrypt the frame using a particular MAC, uh, using a particular um, uh, sequence number. And if it doesn't, we can check to see if the hash works out at the end. And if it doesn't work out, we just increase the record number and you, the sequence number and then you try to decrypt again. So we can do this with not very much, in our experiments at least, the, the cost of doing this iterating through these sequence numbers is not that high. So we look for the frame, we look for the frame header, if it's a false positive, again, the hash shouldn't work out, right? I mean, there's a cryptographic guarantee there. So um, that's what you get for UTLS. And I can get into this in much, in, in more detail about exactly what we do here uh, later. I want to get through a few more slides first. So uh, I want to talk about the implementation next, but I want to stop and quickly check the pulse of the room. Is there any questions, anything that you want to? Talk about the motivation for you. Like what kind of equation? We'll, we'll get there in, in, the, in the evaluation. That's, that's definitely something we're going to do now. OK, so the implementation, just to get you a sense, um, well, I'll, well, I'll give you some numbers. So in, in the Linux, we worked with the Linux uh, 2632 kernel, and we added these soccer options. We ended up modifying 565 lines of uh, code in the Linux kernel to do this out of order delivery. Basically, what we did was that, um, I don't remember the data, data structures now, but the um, on the receive side, when data went into the out of order queue, we also sent it up to the receiver. That's what we did, right? So that it was easier for us to not have to not enqueue it and have to deal with whatever complications that causes later. But of course, in a clean implementation, you might want to do that. Uh, no. We did not even touch that. So you, this is purely in the upper space of TCP. If you want to divide TCP into two parts. No. It was, it's a strict priority queue. So we were basically, we, uh, we inserted data. We came across a very interesting problem. And so I can talk about, actually, if you want, I can talk about the implementation. Um, let me see, how much time do I have left? 20 minutes. And I should probably save time for, yeah, okay. I can, let me talk about this now. This is fun stuff. So um, Ah, the, the kernel implementation, right? So, the, so on the send side, what we simply do is we take an application write, and we uh, normally what Linux does is it tries to pack it into the SK buffs, right? The SK buffs are basically MTU size or MSS sized. And it tries to pack it within an SK buff, and uh, the SK buffs basically become packets that leave the wire. What we did do, what 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 we did was we took the message and we said this message is an entire SK buff. And we are going to delimit the message by saying this is where an SK buff boundary will appear. And we added some metadata to the SK buff so that it could tell us what the priority priority was for each SK buff. So when you came in, when a new write came down and became an SK buff, we would insert it in the right place in the SK buff queue. Does that make sense? One of the problems is that the, uh, Linux does congestion control in SK buffs. <laughs> this is fun stuff. So when you have small messages coming through, suddenly your, your TCP throughput is down on the floor, right? It is like totally, because you have, uh, uh, because the Linux congestion control um, uh, machine assumes that one SK buff maps to one MSS. And when you have small application message writes that are coming down, that's not the case in our implement, in our modification. So I think the right solution to that is to change the Linux implementation to byte congestion control. And if anybody who's going to watch this video later or is now listening to it and wants to do this, go for it. It's a good idea. Yes. 
that's correct but then but then they don't all the, the problem is that you so let's let's think about it like this right when you have a serial when you have a fee for queue and data is coming down from the application even if it's small writes they all get coalesced back to back to back to back but if i send down five packets with five different priorities they're not going to get coalesced anymore because one of them comes up let's say let's say the application says here's a message priority is 5 where 5 is low priority and 1 is high right so 5 comes into the queue then down comes 4 goes ahead of this and gets stuck up here and then 3 gets stuck uh, in front of it so yes you can try and coalesce within priorities so if i have a number of um, application writes that are coming down that are of the same priority you can coalesce them and we do that but when there are different priorities you can't coalesce them Oh, yeah, no, exactly. That's right. It happens way up when data stuff gets queued in the send buffer. Yes, it would be lovely if the coalescing happened later. Um, yeah, so, so, yeah, so we have to, I mean, that's, that's something that can be fixed. It's not a fundamental problem. It can definitely be fixed. It's just something we encountered. So I wanted to share that because you're asking about the implementation. Um, um, so that's what we... Uh, we modified this uh, uh, here and the user space library as it turns out is basically 732 lines of code for UCOBs and uh, that can be reduced um, but or at least it can be made tighter and then we modified 586 lines of code in UTLS uh, in OpenSSL to implement UTLS. So there's not a lot of you know uh, you have to see that there's not a lot of code and here's what I want you to compare this to compare this to a brand new transfer protocol. Okay, and that's the comparison you ought to be making because you're sort of going there. Yes. Yeah. I uh, I'll check the numbers in the paper again, but I'm pretty sure it's the kernel code. Um, the TCP. Sorry, sorry. Yes, yes. So I'm right. Yeah, so it's right. I believe so. I mean, I, I, I'm not going to. So I, I, I have to go back to the paper to see what exactly. But yeah, it has to be part of the uh, uh, because we compared against other transport protocols ultimately. So it doesn't necessarily make sense to take the entire kernel code, um, but only the TCP code. Right. Yes, I should know that. Okay. Um, so I want to show you a few results. Excuse me. Um, one of them is just to show you that Minion actually, or UTCP, does what it does. What I say it should do. That the implementation does what I said it should do. And what would we expect to see is something that you should think about. At the receiver, we want data to not be held back when there's a loss, right? And that's what we see. So on the y-axis here, you're seeing app message sequence number. At the receiver, we have these app messages, which are basically TLV encoded frames just for this experiment. And we have just sort of time on the x-axis here. Okay, now these values really don't matter. This is a functionality graph. So what you're seeing here with the green is TCP behavior. When there's a loss, there's this long pause, and then there's this bursty delivery that happens at the receiver. As you can see here, for example, right here there's a pause, and all of these x's tell you when data packet delivery happens or message delivery happens up to the application. And with UTCP, you can see this really nice sort of the slope is maintained, and then data gets retransmitted and is delivered and then we continue on with data that we hadn't received before, right? And we'll see these dips with UTCP in sequence number because older data just came through now. With TCP, you'll never see that. You'll never see a downward dip in sequence number, right? Because it's always in order delivery. So, so it seems to be working. And this is to show you what the send side can achieve. So uh, uh, this is basically with application message priorities at the send side where we are using a priority queue in kernel. And um, the experiment here is a completely artificial experiments just to show functionality, but it's very uh, um, instructive. The uh, application here sends every 100th message uh, with a higher priority than the rest of the 99 messages. So 99 messages with low priority, there's just two priorities in this queue, and then the 100th message is high priority. Okay, and the uh, network here has a 60 millisecond round of time and has 0.5% loss, which is 
uh, which is what we used here for this experiment. Uh, and here's what I want you to see in this messy sort of crowded graph. We try to do the same thing, low priority and high priority, the application. This is an, applic an application that's using either TCP or UTCP. It doesn't matter which one, right? It's COBS encoding and underneath it can be TCP or UTCP. We compared the two, basically. With TCP, uh, what you would expect to see is that high and low priority doesn't mean anything because TCP doesn't respect those things, right? It doesn't mean anything for TCP per se. Everything is FIFO. You send on a message, it gets to the back of the queue and that's all you can expect. So with TCP, both low and high priority traffic, which in this case are the, are the red and green curves, basically run with each other. And with the UTCP case, you would expect the low priority traffic, which is the bulk of the data, to sort of run with them as well, which it does. But what you get with UTCP is this really nice low latency curve for the high priority traffic. And this was partially expected, but mostly took me by surprise. It took me by surprise it was so low. It was much lower than the rest of it. And uh, one of the reasons why it actually ends up being so low is that this works beautifully with TCP. Um, I'll explain this. What I'm trying to say here is that TCP is an engine that works well when there's a lot of data in it, right? So the low priority traffic is sort of keeping this engine running. When high priority traffic comes in, it hits the head of the send queue, and there's probably an ACK just coming in and immediately leaves and reaches the receiver, not blocked anywhere that the receiver gets delivered up immediately. So you get this really nice effect. And if it's lost in the network, this is the best part. If it gets dropped in the network, the subsequent low priority data will allow TCP to recover that with a fast retransmission. So this basically allows us to send high priority data, not only in the way that it bypasses buffers, but also bypasses the send side buffer, but also in the way that the low priority traffic actually helps to get it across to the other side. And I think that's uh, uh, that was something that I hadn't thought about, but that came through. Yes. MTU, so one packet. Uh, in this case, yes, it is the case, I think. But we have some numbers in the paper that try for different message sizes. The results, I mean, these, these numbers don't matter. I think what matters here is the principle, or at least what mechanisms kick in to help what. And if uh, I, uh, it's actually difficult to run a, sim, uh, a TCP connection with sparse data. Right? I mean, it's a difficult thing because uh, if data gets lost in the network, it gets dropped in the network, that TCP connection, single TCP connection by itself will have difficulty recovering from that loss quickly. But by combining it with a high load uh, a TCP connection, but allowing that priority to be maintained, gives us this nice low curve. Um, yeah. So, so that's, so again, I mean, I, I should have said this earlier that lower is better in this case. We are measuring latency here, app measured end-to-end -end latency at the application, uh, not in the stack, not in the network, at the application. Yes? So that's an interesting question. It could be either. Well, no, I would say in this case, in general, I expect that it would be a loss event of a high priority packet. That's what I would expect it to be, not that of a low priority. Because even if a low priority in, in this network, your window is not going to be too small. The congestion window for the sender is not going to be too small, which means that's going to be all you need is for the congestion window to have space for one new data packet to go out in this experiment. Right here? Yeah, it's it's definitely not a, well, it could be a timeout. I don't want to speculate at this point. I mean, I, I actually have to look at it. Do you want to, yeah, Matt. What's it? Yes. Yeah, so I mean, you probably will see more timeouts here than you. That's what I was saying, yeah. You probably got timeouts from that. You could have gotten timeouts from that. Yes. Yeah. 
I don't have it inside the server. The, the blue line, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, ah, okay, I see. So, so um, well, there are two answers to that. I don't know that that's, so, so this, there's another effect that's playing in this experiment, which is the condition control effect that I talked about. When these messages are going in, that uh, uh, this, um, um, these overall throughput here was a little lower. We fixed that later, but then this was from an earlier iteration of the implementation. Um, these are different experiments. So I don't know that, and this is just a, you know, a time slice from two different experiments with no statistical importance at this point, except that we see these trends. So it's, it's a little hard for me to talk about it that way. All right, just a couple more results. Um, well, before we get into the, the rest of the results, uh, you said why, somebody said what applications do care about this, right? So the first thing I'd say is that you get some instant karma for building Minion. The instant karma is that it can work immediately with interactive streaming, with video conferencing, with better web browsing. You can get parallel HTTP requests. I'll talk about that in a moment. I'll show you some results from that. And this is a really cool one, uh, which is that you can use Minion tunnels instead of SSL, standard TCP SSL tunnels, because it closer replicates what the network looks like than a TCP channel does. Uh, we have, again, results in the paper. I won't talk about that here. But these are all instant applications that can use uh, um, Minion right away um, because they are well-tuned for that. Medium-term karma is that Minion services become available at design time. So if you're building a new application, you should think about this. You, know, you can actually use Minion services to build new applications from the ground up instead of trying to port existing applications to use Minion. And there's always, of course, uh, there's the um, reincarnative karma, which you know happens if you believe in it, um, where you get this next generation transport abstraction on top of which new transports get built. Right? So, um, so I have a comment yes. about uh, video conferencing. I think Minion is still is a reliable protocol, right? right. A lot of the video conferencing apps say I think more unreliable configuration. Right. Right. So my understanding is similar that video in particular is uh, expect is increasingly is needs reliability. Audio, on the other hand, can still deal with losses. That's my understanding because you're not really doing a lot more compression in there. You're just sort of trying to get that little bit of data across. Right. Right. That's I think that's yeah. Probably yeah. the of the yes. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so I'll show you a couple of uh, real applications. One of them is voice over IP. So we basically uh, know that these are uh, delay sensitive applications where long round of time delays for recovery of losses is actually perceptible, can be perceptible for long RTT uh, networks, and it can frustrate users quite a bit uh, when that happens. Word codecs tend to be highly sensitive to burst losses. Uh, and, and generally can't interpolate when many packets are lost, but they tend to be okay with singular losses, one or two uh, losses that they can interpolate over. So um, we built this into applications, into a VoIP application. We used uh, um, a real um, voice file to, and, and, and we figured out, we made it run over TCP as well as UDP and over Minion. Uh, and there's a setup. What you're seeing here is basically burst length, because that's what matters in many of these cases. Burst length from the application's point of view uh, of losses and the fraction of frames that were lost, all in all. And UDP is way up there to the left, so left is good, right? Because smaller your burst length, smaller the every loss incident, if it's smaller in burst size, the better the codec works. So more to the left is better, more to the left and top is better. So UDP uh, does the best in terms of burst length because you don't get, typically, in this case at least, you don't get uh, um, burst losses, huge burst losses. TCP uh, does quite poorly. 
And, and the reason it does poorly is because, not because these many burst packets are lost in the network, it's because those, they don't get delivered to the application by play out time. They're all queued in the receive buffer waiting for a loss recovery to happen. And when they get delivered, they're all wasted or they're mostly all useless. And Minion gets over that hurdle. Right? Minion basically delivers everything up, so a coder can interpolate over those individual losses and can use the rest of the data that otherwise TCP would have held in the kernel. So that's an interesting result to follow with your observation that actually is a question and everything. And right. the, the, the question I have here is, yes, you will get out of all the but you sure. might not be able to do anything about it. Right. So in the, in, the, in the case where you need reliable order delivery, Minion is not the right answer. Right? I mean, TCP is still your best answer at that point. But in the case where you can actually use unordered data and do stuff with it, like in this case we did, it's useful. That's what I would say. I mean, Minion is not the answer to all questions, right? This is all uh, an example of a lost, deliberately lost protocol over the one lost going. That's what's saying. It's basically it's all saying about deliberately lossy. Deliberately, well, deliberate, sorry, deliberately adapting to loss, living with it. Living. That's sort of right. Yes, yes. I mean, we, the, the point is that here, even if the, retra if the retransmission can be received within the playout buffer, then it's still useful. That's where actually T Minion wins over UDP, is that we get 100% delivery. Some of it may not be used because the delivery is still the same as TCPs. Right? Yes. It's also about Sure. It's not. Yes. So I want to show you one more result. I'm running out of time, and, and I don't want to uh, 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 keep um, um, this result from you, because I think this is a valuable one as well. Um, the other application we looked at was the web. And this is something that we weren't the first ones to discuss. Folks here have done this, worked on basically trying to, uh, to, to build parallelism here, right? We have independent objects on web pages. TCP has this throughput versus parallelism trade-off where when you put everything down the pipe, which is what, t which is what you try to do with pipelining, uh, is that you, are, uh, you, you send multiple objects on the pipe, but there's head of line blocking because TCP imposes this ordering constraint. SCTP got over this by giving you multi-streaming, which was basically multiple logical channels within one whole connection. The reason you didn't want to break up the TCP connection across objects is because you would have smaller objects and the, the overall performance would not be as good. TCP doesn't do very well with small objects, with small payloads. So you have this trade-off between parallelism and throughput, and we were able to build multi-streaming with Minion. Minion gives you unordered delivery. We were able to build partial order on top of it, which is what multi-streaming is. It's partial order. It's ordering within a stream, but order independent across uh, streams within a whole connection. The whole connection ensures that you get congestion control, loss recovery. Everything is aggregated across all the data. So you get the good effects of TCP. You take out the bad ordering constraint, and you can get multi-streaming, where we have a center that breaks the data into chunks and adds a stream header and throws everything into UCOBS and sends it over UTCP. And so we avoid HOL blocking at the receiver across these streams. Uh, we don't really use center side priority in this one uh, at all, but it's purely head of line blocking avoidance. And we tried this with a real workload. We got a, a bunch of traces and we drove them over a network and we had a sender send back responses and we measured different times. And what you're gonna see here are a number of graphs, but uh, uh, I'll, I'll describe them to you. The top three graphs here, so these are just divided by total page size. Okay, These are different page sizes on log scales. What you have here is, uh, um, I'm sorry, these are uh, on the x-axis you have uh, a total page size and there's a total number of requests per page, so total number of objects in the page. And you would expect to see more benefit as with Minion and multi-streaming as parallelism on a page increases. Right, so you want to see better benefits like this way. And up there, those three graphs simply show that Minion doesn't outperform or doesn't underperform TCP in terms of throughput because it is basically TCP uh, in terms of throughput. But here, uh, we measure the average time to first byte. It was a metric we um, thought might capture the idea of when does a user, what is user perceived latency. 
average time to first byte of each object on the page. And you see that overall, Minion generally tends to have lower uh, user perceived latency at any rate, right? Because we are able to basically multiplex across these different streams. And this is something that's again not new. This is something that's been known. But the fact that now you can build it and make it look like TCP on the wire, we think is new. So right. So without pipelining, when I mean, you're basically you're basically saying uh, it's you have one connection per object. In this case, one stream per object. That was the idea. You don't really need pipelining in the traditional sense. Uh, it's not back to back. So let me step back from that for a moment. What I'm trying to say here is that we could get the problem with HTTP 1.0, one of the big problems with HTTP 1.0 was that you had one connection per object. And they were doing that because that was a, perhaps the simplest thing to do, but it also gave maximum parallelism. We were able to achieve that kind of parallelism here. More no, it's more streams within the one connection. So we have, we are able to create multiple logical channels within a TCP stream, within one TCP connection, such that no stream blocks any other stream. So they're independent, logically parallel within one TCP connection. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, so, no, it's sending them all at the same time. So, you're, so it actually opened nine TCP connections? No, it's, it's, it's one TCP connection. So the comparison here, the green, is HTTP 1.1, which is pipelining. So the requests are sent back to back, but the responses come also back to back on one connection. So HTTP 1.1, your comparison is? One TCP connection. That's right. That's right. And the HTTP, and this is basically all the requests are also sent in a similar pipeline fashion over one connection, but the responses are sent at the same time. They're multiplexed. Just, just to be fair, I'll say that small browsers they open I know that. And that dramatically imbalances. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and in that this was my so I didn't really make perhaps make this state uh, state this case very clearly. I'm trying to stop that from happening. I mean, I shouldn't say it like that. But what I'm trying to say is that the six parallel connections is to try and get parallelism because one large object on a TCP connection can block a whole bunch of small ones behind them. And if I can give that parallelism with one TCP connection, you need just one. It has two impacts. One parallel perspective is suggesting what is vastly different for six connections for one connection. Sure. In terms of fairness, sure. we get six times the potential bandwidth. That's right. Until I start opening 18 connections. I mean, where does it stop? Happening. No, no, I know, I know it's happening. The problem is that there's no magic number, right? There's no real magic number besides one that's right in this case. There's no reason to say that four is the right answer. Maybe, you know, 20 is perhaps better. The uh, point is that it, it depends on the fact that others are not doing the same thing or it's an, it's an arms race, basically, of, of number of connections, if you think about it in terms of throughput. My argument would be that keeping it all within one connection allows you to use as much throughput. Well, you can change the congestion control on that connection if you want to do other things. But really, the connection is sufficient. We shouldn't have to open more than one connection. If you're doing it to increase throughput, that's okay. I'm not going to argue that you shouldn't, uh, right now at least. You know, in a different forum, I would argue that with you. It's, it's, I do think that you shouldn't have to open more than one connection. I still don't understand how do you have multiple logical you have another separate trending layer. Yes, it is. I mean, actually, in the paper, we call this uh, multi. Well, we call it multi-stream TCP, and I used to call it poor man's SCTP. So you actually have another layer of So I have. I have a stream header, which is very heavily inspired by SCTP. But it's basically, I mean, so like I said, I used to call this poor man's SCTP. The reason it's a poor man's SCTP is because I can't get everything that SCTP gives me right now. But at least I can try to get, I can't get SCTP, but I can get something that's, that looks and smells like it. Yes. Oh, the SST work. Well, so, so this, uh, so Brian Ford was, did the SST work. And uh, 
it's all in there together. I mean, I worked on SCDP for a while, and I think these ideas are generally there, definitely there. Yeah. Yes. That's right. I mean, you could also, and if you had dynamic streams, you could actually open streams on the fly. You could, uh, and you could prioritize across them. And it had something really cool, which was receive side flow control per stream, which we can try and build on top of these things. So, um, yeah, very good. So, uh, in conclusion, TCP and TLS work on the internet. And uh, they have been these workhorses of the internet that we've used, right? And, we, and they're increasingly becoming used as substrates. Um, and at this point, instead of trying to fight this battle, we want to try and optimize and make these substrates good solid substrates. And we want to eliminate and kick out latency that's hidden in there. Um, and there is this very well known, if you've not read it, you should go read it, article from Stuart Cheshire from a long time ago that I think still applies. Um, and a lesson here is that we can fit square pegs, these packets or datagrams into these round pipes. And we can eliminate uh, delivery delays and we can make mods deployable, most of these modifications deployable with applications and turn these work horses into pack horses. And I'll close with that. Thank you.